Hello, everybody. It's Stefan Molyneux from Freedom Aid Radio. Hope you're doing well. This is The Decline of Canada, a.k.a. There Will Be No Economic Recovery, the Frozen North Tundra edition from Freedom Aid Radio. The only freedom, remember, is freedom from illusion. So people are generally told that the Canadian economy has a lot of positive attributes, that the Canadian banking sector weathered the recent financial storms, uh, and uh, that there's a sound, stable, and relatively free economy with low government jet debt to GDP. We will be examining this in a little bit more detail. And it's true that there are some strengths. Canada tackled a lot of its um, truly tumorous, excessive government spending in the 90s. And Canada did not have a massive stimulus package, which is one of the reasons why the economy has been strong, and uh, so on. But let's look historically. So from the 1970s, uh, where Canada and the U.S. started off with similar um, unemployment rates, uh, Canada's unemployment rate has continually trended higher up until the recent financial crash has continually trended higher by a percentage point or sometimes even two percentage points uh, above the U.S. Uh, and this, of course, uh, creates significant costs in terms of social programs and significant loss of productivity gains uh, because people, of course, are not, not working and rather consuming. So uh, this is uh, significant. This is um, uh, the result of Canada's uh, increased uh, socialist commitments to uh, to its population or at its population. So there's one uh, way in which the Canadian economy has remained relatively weak relative to the U.S. And one of the reasons for this, and it's masked, uh, the, the, the true degree of it is masked as well, uh, the public sector is enormous in the Canadian economy. Now in the private sector over the last 30 years, the, um, uh, the uh, unionization rate has dropped by almost 50%. Uh, and this is because uh, unions tend to push for more and more demands for their workers, which tends to make businesses uncompetitive, which tends to put those workers out of a job. And so certainly over the last five years, unions in Canada, in the private sector at least, have become quite reasonable uh, because they look at the company's finances, they recognize that they can't afford more wages, and then they back down on their demands. This doesn't happen in the public sector. I mean, the public sector shouldn't actually theoretically have any um, unions at all, according to even left-wing theories, right? Because Unions are there to, supposedly, according to left-wing theory, unions are there to counteract the desire to crush workers' wages as, so that the you know, fat, evil, monopoly, monocle capitalists can get more profits and have more baths of gold. Uh, but, of course, in the public sector, there's no profit motive to drive down u union wages, so there should, be no pub there should be no need for unionization, but this is where unions have gone because they have continually made uh, businesses uncompetitive in the... Um, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the private sector, and therefore they have retreated to the public sector, which is where they tend to gather <laughs> most of their gold. So if you look at, in Canada, the public sector, a percentage of employees covered by registered pensions in 2011, uh, it's almost 90% in the public sector and less than 25% in the private sector. And um, average retirement age in Canada is uh, 62 and a half for private sectors and 60 for public sector employees. And I hope everybody understands that because it's 60 in the public sector, it has to be higher in the private sector to pay for, because you have less money and higher taxes and so on. Job loss by class of workers for Canada in the thousands. So uh, this is uh, uh, over the last little while. 22.1 uh, for public sector employees, 423.4 for private sector employees. This is uh, in the not even close category. <clears throat> As a percentage of employment, 0.6% for public sector employees, 3.8% for private sector employees. So um, this is one of the problems. Uh, uh, the public sector is what's called upwardly sticky. In other words, it grows as the result of uh, unions, as the result of inefficiencies, as the result of people wanting to give patronage jobs in order to buy votes to get in power, the politicians and so on. But it almost never shrinks, right? So this is sort of continual growth problem. It's um, like a coral reef or something. It just keeps growing and growing. So the result of this has been something very interesting, and this is something which you can see uh, all around the Western world, which is this uh, hollowing out of the middle class. So this is from 1971 to 2011. You can see that the lower income percentage distribution has risen from 25 to 29 percent. The upper income has risen from 14 to 20 percent, and the middle class has dropped from the middle income has dropped from 61 to 51 percent. This is typical in late. A statism, right, as the government grows and as the government particularly uh, borrows to spend and so on, what happens is the poor get trapped in this sort of sticky uh, welfare subsidy underclass and the rich start to manipulate the state to get more and more benefits and both of these are paid for by the middle class. So 
Uh, the middle class is the great ballast of society. When the middle class goes, as it did in the 1920s in, um, uh, under, in the Weimar Republic in Germany, uh, bad things tend to happen. Uh, the middle, cl middle class is the great stabilizer within society, and um, as the government grows, so does the poor, and so do the rich, at the expense generally of the middle class. And if you are in the middle class, you will know what I'm talking about. So as I said, the... Um, uh, in the late 90s, the government in Canada, federal government, was paying 40 cents on the dollar uh, just on interest payments, and so they savaged uh, a fair amount of spending. But these dips are nothing compared to what's grown. I mean, this, is, this would be called savage austerity. Of course, you look at 1960, this is uh, gross Canadian federal government debt, 1867 to 2008. I mean, this massive escalation that has occurred uh, from the 1960s, from the rise of the welfare state. And Canada has almost no warfare state. I mean, it's a very small military. And so this is almost all transfer payments, um, also known as, as vote buying, also known as paying people to not change the system. You know, one of the great problems with things like welfare and unemployment is it tends to drug people's sense of outrage about a system that doesn't work for them because they can kind of get by. And so it's like taking um, cocaine for a toothache. I guess you feel a little better in the short run, but the rot only gets worse. So the demand and a desire for social change is, is really kept at bay through this fire hose of fiat imaginary monopoly money that keeps getting fired at the poor, which prevents them from wanting to change the system, and also keeps getting fired at the rich, which also prevents them from wanting to use their more considerable muscle to attempt to reform a system that doesn't really work very well. So debt, household debt is one of the great unspoken or underspoken of trends in modern Western economies. As real income has declined, as uh, taxes have increased, uh, what people do to sort of wallpaper over these cracks is they just continue to borrow. And of course, as the government prints money, as it tends to do, prints a lot of money, uh, the money washes out into the economy and uh, the inflation hits, and, uh, but the government keeps interest rates low because it doesn't want to pay a lot of interest on its own debt. And this combination really does provoke consumer spending, which is a massive waste of a lot of resources and so on. But people are uh, just uh, borrowing and spending in order to make up for diminished income and also to take advantage of the artificially low interest rates kept in place by Western governments so they don't have to pay money on their own debts. And so here in Canada, you can see this just massive rise from 1980, where um, the, the um, uh, debt to personal income uh, ratio was 80% uh, or so now, you know, heading northwards to 160% and so on exceedingly unsustainable. And you can see this trend through Canada, the US, the Euro area, uh, Euro, Euro area and the United Kingdom. Uh, this is a continual trend. This is unsustainable. Uh, and, and debt, of course, is simply deferred. Um, uh, uh, it's deferred losses. Uh, and what happens, of course, with a lot of debt is you are, you are crowding out investment, right? So as you, as you borrow to consume a whole bunch of stuff, which is generally where this goes, you are crowding out investments in capital improvement and worker productivity growth, as we'll see down the road in this presentation, tends to lag. It's a huge problem. I mean, productivity growth is about the only thing that matters when it comes to having a sustainable and growing economy. And when you borrow to buy a plasma TV, that's fine, but you're not investing uh, in creating better ways of producing things. Household debt to income ratio in G7 countries, 1960 to 2011. Uh, as you can see here, this is you know, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK, and US, uh, all trending upwards from 0.5 to 1.51 1 and so on. Uh, and this is, this is significant. Uh, this is extremely important. Uh, this, uh, is, um, uh, this is a, a, an addiction, right? This is, uh, and all addictions come with the highs and the crashes, and we're just starting to enter into the crashes now. Uh, of course, a lot of this is driven as well by the uh, belief that somehow uh, a, a consumer good like a house is somehow an investment good like a factory, uh, and therefore it rises in value. Uh, this is, of course, not true, and the, the lie of this is becoming revealed through the various housing crashes around the world. You can't get rich by investing in consumption goods, right? You, you, you can't get rich by buying a bunch of cars and driving them around. It just They lose value over time. Same thing with houses. Uh, but um, this idea that your house is an ATM that's going to continue to rise in value is what has fooled people into over-leveraging themselves by borrowing a whole bunch of stuff, by buying a whole bunch of stuff. And when the housing crash comes, uh, this is all revealed as nonsense. Um, so, again, these trends are very, very important and indicate uh, uh, deferred poverty. So, uh, when you have debt, I mean, almost by definition, you're not going to have a whole lot of savings. Uh, so, saving rates in Canada uh, have uh, declined. Uh, retired to debt uh, has declined. Uh, household debt to income ratio, um, you know, 144, 146.9 percent. 
uh, debt to personal disposable income uh, is uh, just lunatic. Uh, and so you can sort of have a look at this. You can pause this if you want to look at these graphs in more detail. Um, so this is um, very, very important. Household debt uh, in trillions uh, has risen from you know 1.4 to 1.6 just over a couple of years. And uh, this is average household uh, debt for a family with, uh, with two children, $176,000. $461. Uh, so low savings means low investment, which means low productivity growth in the future. House prices in Canada. Oh my goodness, what an exciting <laughs> roller coaster this is going to be. Uh, this is from uh, 1980 to 2011. You see that they've gone from about 50,000 constant dollars, from 50,000 to uh, over 350,000. Uh, this is remarkable. I mean, many years ago, uh, I was chatting with a guy who was a teacher, and he said, uh, oh, yeah, when I was a teacher, uh, I made uh, $9,000 a year, uh, and I could buy a house for $12,000. That would be the equivalent of buying a house on average for about seventy to 80000 or maybe $90,000 here now, as opposed to, and this was in Toronto, where the average house price is northwards of about half a million dollars. So uh, it's been completely mad. Uh, but this is what happens uh, when you have, um, of course, a lot of immigration. This is what happens when you have very low interest rates. Uh, so interest rates really should be set by the free market, not by government fiat, in order for there to be 